Today, we're on the banks of the Green River, and we're gonna meet up with a couple of biologists and a whole crew of volunteers as they try to do a very important mission, and that is save and relocate some mussels as this water level starts to change. We're gonna meet up with Monty McGregor, who's a biologist with the Department of Fish and Wildlife, and learn a little more from some of these volunteers, find out why they're out here, and what we hope to see in the Green River in years to come. I just pulled up here next to Mike Compton and you're actually finding some mussels in this muddy bank right here, aren't you? Yep. You're kind of heading up this project and all the volunteer efforts to get down here and do this recovery. Tell me why this is so important. So a couple years ago, I think it was 2016, Lock and Dam 6 on the Green River breached, caused a major safety hazard. But for decades, talk of removing the Lock and Dams on the Green River has been discussed to remove them. And so with the breach of Lock and Dam 6, that spurred more conversations to remove Lock and Dam 5, as well as Barren River Lock and Dam number one. And so that process is happening now. And in a couple of weeks, Lock and Dam 5 should be fully removed. And with that, the water levels are gonna drop significantly, and it's going to leave some mussels high and dry for a while. I'm with Cassie here with the Sam Shine Foundation, and you are a volunteer out here helping restore these mussels or get them back to the water. But you have a vested interest in conservation and water quality. Yes, I do. Our foundation is a conservation-focused family foundation, um, and I'm their director of freshwater programs, so I'm thinking about rivers all the time and thinking about how we use our water. And so we're all about stream reconnection and those fish that uh, carry mussels up and down the stream can get to them easier with streams reconnected. And so I'm interested in what's happening here in the Green River and certainly I'm interested in the mussel population. So it isn't often that you can grab on to the animals and actually do something for them that day, but this feels very rewarding. I, I feel like a hero. Well, we can't come to the Green River and talk about mussels without talking to Dr. Monty McGregor. Monty, you spent a lot of time out here on Green River. It's one of the most significant tributaries in the whole Ohio River system in the country. It's got about 75 species of freshwater mussels. That's about 25% of what we have in the country, all here in one river system. And so it's got a lot of fish species as well. And anytime you find mussel species, you know, a lot of diversity, you have good clean water, you have great fishing, uh, there's a connection there to the fish. And so it's a good for everybody. You've spent your life helping the mussels. I mean, you've spent studying and researching and found new ways to raise mussels. We've released tons of mussels back into Green River and other rivers throughout the state of Kentucky. Today, the help is a little more hands-on, isn't it? It's not research-based. It's you're physically digging them up and putting them out a little deeper water so that they don't dry up, right? Right, and uh, so we're here just to help the mussels get back into the deeper water where they might not be able to naturally. Uh, they're not used to that kind of fluctuation and that quick, especially since it's never gotten that low before ever. So we're just here with a team of folks from all over the place, that even from other states that have come, knowing the importance of the Green River, and we're looking for rare species, we're looking for common, whatever, and just throwing them back in deeper water and giving them a chance to make it. So you are literally coming in and saving these mussels. Now they can move. But asking them to move long distances or to try to move while dry just doesn't work very well, does it? It doesn't work as well. And a lot of times there's a lot of wood or rocks. They'll bump against that and then they get wedged and they're trapped. So we're going through trying to free up those muscles, put them into deeper water to where when the water is drained a little bit, they'll be able to still survive. It does feel full circle to be here today helping these mussels out. And we just kind of pulled up to you while you were out here on the stream. Have you already relocated some mussels back to the water today? Oh yeah, I, I wish I had kept count. I started counting about uh, an hour in this morning and I'm probably up to about 50 mussels. Oh wow. And we're at this point, just it's just a, a save. You just get them back into water where they're not gonna be left high and dry. I was looking at these trails down here. You can actually see where the mussels kind of have a clear path to the water here. So they're probably gonna be be okay they don't need my help as much as some of those down in the more in the gravelly areas some of them are huge like look at the size of this this is a living animal i don't know what that weighs probably a pound and a half that's a big size muscle is this one of the more common not common what, what do we got here this is the washboard and it's it's one of the more common species we have anywhere in the country in the eastern united states it gets really large even a lot larger than that uh, they can weigh seven or eight pounds a lot of other stuff we have. We have 
This is a fat mucket. It's it's really pretty. It's got a lot of beautiful rays on it. Wow. It's also common in these deeper pools. It uses a bass as a host. So anytime you see this species, you know you're gonna have find bass. Its sister species is the regular plain pocketbook, and uh, this one gets fairly large. It's like a softball size, and it also uses a bass and. They have a little lure and they go fishing. So they're out here in the bottom of the river and they got a little piece of flesh that looks like a fish and they're wiggling it like that. So anytime you see a bunch of these, you know there's a good bass population around. They're not going to eat the bass. Their lure is to get the bass to try to eat it. And when it does, that's how it releases its eggs, right? That's correct. So this species here is called the yellow sand shell. And it's really not that common in the Green River. This one uses a gar as a host and there's a lot of gar in the river and it comes out at nighttime. The fish will, under the moonlight, will see it and come and strike it thinking it's a little fish. And that's how it connects to its fish host. So it's pretty amazing. I know you do a lot of work with mussels and other fish species in all of our waterways in the state of Kentucky. But a project like this, there's only so many mussel biologists to go around and it takes volunteers, doesn't it? Oh, it does, tremendously. It's, it's a conservation a team sport is what I often say. Yeah, absolutely. So there's people all up and down through here that are doing the exact same thing you're doing. Some of them are out on rock bars and picking up big numbers of mussels. Mm -hmm. And right now you're kind of focused on this muddy area where it's got some wood substrate to kind of free them and get them over to the deeper water. Yep. And you're having success. How many mussels have you yep. recovered today? Today, I've probably recovered about 300 or so. Oh, wow. Everyone has a vested interest in having cleaner, clearer water, and I can't think of a better way to help clean our water systems than the use of mussels. It doesn't get more natural than no, that. No, <laughs> no, and I, yeah, I'm sure you, you've done a lot of programs on mussels. You know one mussel can filter like 15 gallons of water a day, and that's for uh, those that need a little help with math conversions, that's a keg of beer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so <laughs> that's, uh, beer doesn't weigh as much in Kentucky as bourbon, I know, but. <laughs> and that's one muscle, you start thinking yes. about the hundreds of thousands yes. that are out here yes. and the way that they pull the water in, they're siphon and mm -hmm. blow it out. I mean, they're feeding on that plankton and yep. bacteria, whatever it is that they're pulling yep. it out. You can only imagine what millions of those up and down this river, the impact that we'd have if the muscles weren't here it would be detrimental. Right, it's kind of one of those, you don't know what you got until it's gone. Yeah. So we're working to be sure that we actually bolster the numbers and they come back. Yeah. So the mussels can live a long time. And this one here is about seven or eight years old. You can see from, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then the seven is on the edge of the shell. So you can actually age them by the rings like a tree. And the longest lived mussel in the state of Kentucky would be what? Probably about a hundred years, the spectacle case. And it's also found in the Green River. Now what's the difference between mussels and clams? So a lot of ones you're seeing that are on the banks are the Asian clam. These don't need fish host. They reproduce way differently. These reproduce self-fertilization. And these are a lot more prolific and there's thousands and thousands of them. And they, and they live about two or three years and die. Yeah. So some of these are natural mortality that where they just die natural, you know, when they get old. The interesting thing about this river is the dams that are coming out are in the best part of the river. So we're gonna see probably one of the best restoration projects available in the country by taking out three or four of these dams because we're opening up new habitat for fish, mussels, any aquatic species in the best part of the river that's not been really available to those animals for over 100 years. It's such a cool project restoring the Green River, which runs through a beautiful part of central Kentucky. This is an amazing place. It's an amazing river, and we're trying to do what we can to keep it that way.